I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present, and elders from other communities who might be here today. Today I am delighted to welcome Elizabeth Hind here to give a talk. Liz is currently an NHMRC Career Development Fellow and she recently joined the School of Physics at the University of Melbourne, where she holds the Jacob Hameson and Beverly Macklenburg Lectureship. She also has a joint appointment in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Melbourne. Elizabeth's background is in biophysics. She completed her PhD at the University of Melbourne before joining the lab of Professor Enrico Graton at the University of California, Irvine. While in the Graton lab, Elizabeth developed a number of methods based on fluorescence correlation spectroscopy and fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, also known as FLIM, both techniques which allow you to look at the movement and interaction of molecules inside of living cells. And she applied these methods to understanding some basic biological questions about membrane lipids, chromatin organization, the dynamics of transcription factors, and protein oligomerization. After her time in the Graton lab, Liz returned to Australia as UNSW Vice Chancellor Fellow and later a Cancer Institute Early Career Fellow within the EMBL Australian Node for Single Molecule Science. Liz's work is really at the interface between physics and biology, and she's been recognized by both the US Biophysical Society and the Australian Society of Biophysics. So please welcome Elizabeth Hind. Okay, so thank you Kelly for the introduction and the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some of the research we're doing, which is looking at uh, mapping DNA target search in the nucleus of a living cell. So there's approximately two metres of DNA inside the nucleus of a cell. And given that the nucleus is around 10 microns in diameter, DNA has to be extensively folded around histones and compacted into the chromatin network. And this compacting event is multi-layered and it ends up with two main types of chromatin, euchromatin, which is transcriptionally accessible, and a heterochromatin-like structure, which is less accessible. So chromatin serves a barrier function, and local rearrangements regulate access to the DNA template. So in one configuration, certain DNA sequences will be accessible to transcription factors. Then the DNA may compact and rearrange into a new configuration that opens up accessibility to different uh, DNA template. The 3D spatial arrangement of DNA inside the living cell essentially determines what genes are expressed and disruptions in this structural framework are what can lead to disease. So inside the nucleus of a cell, there are thousands of molecules randomly diffusing throughout this structural framework, searching for a target DNA sequence, and there's three main technical difficulties in observing this. The first is that nuclear zone packaging is well below the diffraction limit and the radius of our point spread function, which is our observation volume on an optical microscope. The second uh, complication is the fact that chromatin rearrangements occur on a fast time scale, sometimes micro to milliseconds. And so because they're rearranging between this open and compacted state, you observe an ensemble effect depending on how fast you image chromatin. And then the third complication, in addition to the fact that the chromatin structure is, well, is much smaller than our optical observation volume, it's constantly rearranging, is the fact that the molecules we're interested in looking at and how they interact with this template, it's not like there's one transcription factor searching for a target DNA sequence in this volume. There's hundreds of them. And so if you tag them with a fluorescent protein and they're all performing transits at the same time, it's difficult to observe at the single molecule level how these molecules navigate um, nuclear architecture. And so we're using methods based on fluorescence lifetime and fluctuation spectroscopy to get around these three uh, difficulties. So today I'm going to talk about three projects. The first is our older project, looking at the accessibility of nuclear landscape via something called pair correlation analysis, but um, it will help understand the two later projects that we're currently working on. And they are looking at transcription factor activation via brightness analysis, because a lot of transcription factors oligomerize upon activation, and so we're using this to our advantage to locate when and where they interact with the DNA specifically. And then the other current project I'll talk about um, is this using FlimFret microscopy applied to fluorescently labelled histones to probe directly um, chromatin rearrangements during the DNA damage response. <laughs> 
So this first project is the, is the background information for understanding why we're looking at these two projects. And to, to really understand a lot of the things I'll say today, um, I would like to introduce fluorescence fluctuation spectroscopy. So this is a branch of methods where basically you analyze fluctuations in the fluorescence intensity signal due to molecules moving in and out of an observation volume. And by doing this, we can reveal local protein concentration, mobility, and their brightness. So we need a small observation volume, and a confocal laser scanning microscope provides us with this via the use of laser and a pinhole. And essentially, if we park our laser at any point inside the cell, for example, the nucleus, and we have a GFP-tagged fluorescent protein transfected into our cell, then every time a molecule moves through this small observation volume, we'll see a fluctuation in the fluorescence intensity. And so this is the signal that we use to analyze more or less protein um, dynamics and interactions. So a fluorescence fluctuation is incredibly useful, um, and the way you analyze it is in terms of two aspects. First, we look at the distribution of amplitudes that we get from each molecule moving through our observation volume, because this amplitude, it tells us about how many molecules are present at that location and how bright are they. The second piece of information we're interested in is the duration of each fluctuation, because this tells us about how fast are the molecules moving at that specific location. We use something called an order correlation function to analyze this signal, and essentially it statistically goes through the signal and compares it with itself for all possible delay times. And this function is important because it tells us about the characteristic diffusion rate of the molecules at that location, and the amplitude tells us about how many molecules are there. So just from analyzing a fluctuation, you can get in vivo for a protein labeled with a fluorescent tag, how fast are they moving, how many are at that location, and what's their oligomeric state, which is related to the brightness of the fluorescent protein. So we've used this technology extensively to look at chromatin organization, and um, people have used in particular the single point fluorescence fluctuation spectroscopy to look at the accessibility of chromatin structure. So here's a nucleus expressing H2A tag to RFP. And in this paper, Dross et al. acquired a series of single point FCS measurements and acquired the fluctuations at these locations and asked the question, how is GFP diffusion modulated in regions of heterochromatin versus regions of euchromatin? And surprisingly, they found that the diffusion coefficient of an inert tracer such as GFP was independent of the local chromatin density. So local diffusion of fluorescent proteins appeared to be independent of the local chromatin compaction status. So given that there was no change in the mobility of this fluorescent tracer in relation to chromatin density, potentially there was a spatial dependence on the diffusion of these molecules that was outside this spatial resolution of the observation volume. So maybe GFP's diffusive route is instead regulated rather than its local diffusion coefficient. And so this wouldn't be picked up by doing a series of single point measurements because all the fluctuations are just independent measurements. But instead, if we acquire a line scan across a heterogeneous region of chromatin where there's compaction and no compaction, we can spatially correlate our fluorescence fluctuations. And this is important because instead of this experiment, if we have a line scan, we can now see is GFP forced to diffuse around a more compact structure, or is EGFP allowed to diffuse through chromatin and maybe um, arrive at the other side on a delayed time scale? So with a line scan, we can look at the diffusive route of GFP or nuclear proteins and how they're regulated by chromatin organization as opposed to a single point FCS measurement. And in particular, by using something called pair correlation analysis, we can really start to look at the arrival time of molecules in and out of different chromatin environments. So probing rearrangements in chromatin microstructure from the use of pair correlation is something we've used extensively. And I'll just briefly go over how the measurement works. But essentially, on a confocal microscope, you scan a line across whatever barrier you're interested in, like a heterochromatin foci, and you scan this line rapidly as a function of time. So that in every pixel, you have a fluorescence fluctuation. And if I'm interested in how molecules move from one position to some other position along my line scan that's delta R away, then I just cross-correlate these two fluorescence fluctuations for all possible delay times. And if I do this, if the molecules do arrive at this second location, I'll get a positive correlation that decays with some characteristic time. If they get there faster, it will decay faster. If the molecules never arrive there, I'll never get a positive correlation above zero. 
And most importantly, if the molecules do get there, but they encountered some obstacle that delayed their arrival time, I get this characteristic anti-correlation preceding a peak, and this peak tells me exactly what time the molecules get from A to B. And because I have pairs of correlations all along my line scan, I can essentially map molecular flow along this acquisition. So for example, if I simulate heterochromatin and look at how GFP diffuses with respect to an inaccessible obstacle, versus euchromatin where maybe GFP can get in and get out, I recover two characteristic pair correlation carpets. The first is a disconnect molecular flow pattern that tells me GFP diffuses outside, inside this structure, but with no communication in between. And then the second type of carpet you can get is a, a double arc feature where molecules can get in and out and you read off the time scale. So this is the key to understanding a lot of the data that I'll present. So we use this assay to look at how chromatin organization in human cells is regulated with respect to different DNA density environments. And here we have a human cell expressing GFP with the DNA labeled in Herxt. We scan a line rapidly across a region of euchromatin and heterochromatin. And here you can see this from the intensity profile of Herxt. And we cross-correlate how long does it take GFP to access and exit this environment by a distance of eight pixels. And when we do this, we recover a correlation carpet where there's more or less no positive correlation. So on the time scale of our experiment, GFP cannot access this heterochromatin region. If we instead do pair correlation at a distance of 14 pixels, so now we're looking at, can GFP go around this obstacle? So can GFP flow around heterochromatin? But also maybe can GFP get stuck in heterochromatin and flow to another piece of heterochromatin? In this instance, we get a disconnect molecular flow pattern where GFP molecules can get around this obstacle and GFP molecules appear to be diffusing within this highly compact environment. So collectively, these two measurements tell us that GFP can diffuse around heterochromatin, it can diffuse within euchromatin and on different timescales. In fact, we find that GFP diffuses throughout euchromatin on a timescale of two milliseconds and throughout heterochromatin on a timescale of eight milliseconds, but with no communication in between. So this prompted us to ask the question, if there's GFP diffusion in both environments but no communication in between, how do the molecules exist in these two different uh, states? And the answer comes down to the fact that we averaged out these rare bursts of molecules going from heterochromatin to euchromatin-like DNA density environments, and they occur on a 300 millisecond timescale. So it's like the chromatin opens up um, intermittently and allows GFP diffusion in between, and these opening events are ATP dependent. So why does this matter? Well, we've found that this is conserved in many different types of systems. For example, chromatin condensation during mitosis we find that those bursts of opening and closing are shut down, and this is also true in the C. elegans germline if you look at mitotic versus interphase nuclei. We've also looked at um, DNA-dependent diffusion of a transcription factor in the Arabidopsis route, and we find that this transcription factor is also regulated by these rules that we've observed for free GFP. In particular, it was also observed in different um, cell types. So now we've got this baseline understanding of how diffusion is regulated in the nucleus. We became interested in looking at transcription factors, which would be a more biologically relevant um, experiment. And in the case of transcription factors, which are DNA binding proteins that are looking for a target DNA sequence, they often self-associate when looking for a target DNA sequence and upon binding their um, target DNA sequence. So again, if we go back to the fact that chromatin organization is complex and we have so our transcription factors diffusing throughout this complex environment looking for a target DNA sequence. Fortunately, we know from single particle experiments where you set up a system such that there's so few molecules you can track them independently, that their main mode of transport is underpinned by diffusion and then these non-specific binding events. And then upon finding a target DNA sequence, they undergo specific binding. But the problem is that transcription factors don't act alone. In general, their um, behavior is modulated by the global expression level, and so it's also important to study transcription factors in a population level uh, and an ensemble-based measurement. So while single particle tracking experiments are important, if you have the entire population, you can start to look at things like how self-association regulates this um, navigation of the nuclear landscape. So we know that transcription factors employ self-association to regulate nuclear import, DNA target search, 
and DNA binding activity. And in particular, there's this transcription factor family called the STATs. And um, in the case of STAT3, they use dimerization and tetramerization heavily to modulate nuclear import as well as DNA binding activity. So STAT3, for example, will form dimers that translocate the nuclear envelope, and once inside the nucleus, depending on the DNA sequence, will further dimerize to form tetramers. And this is thought to modulate their affinity and specificity for different DNA sequences. So if you have your cell transfected with GFP, for example, STAT3 tagged a GFP, Obviously, all these events are occurring in the background of a sea of monomers. So when STAT3 forms a dimer or a tetramer, in the case of there being monomers present, it's very difficult to see when and where this happens or how it regulates the mobility of this protein. But fortunately, transcription factor oligomerization offers a feature of contrast in the, in the context of fluorescence fluctuation spectroscopy. Because if you're... If your molecule is tagged with a fluorescent protein and it self-associates, it becomes a brighter complex. And so because we can pull out what, how bright a molecule is in each pixel of an image, we now have a way to track our transcription factor when it does associate. And because it's often associated with transcriptional activation, we have a way now to look at where this transcription factor is active inside the nucleus, despite our protein being tagged all with GFE. So we proposed to use this as a feature of contrast for tracking DNA target search, but first we had to develop a method that could track protein mobility as a function of oligomeric state. So there's a, a fluorescence fluctuation-based method called moment analysis, and essentially this can be implemented on most confocal microscopes, and it can extract the fluorescent um, oligomeric state of any fluorescent protein in each pixel of an image. So again, here's a picture of the confocal microscope and the small observation volume it offers. But of course, with the raster scan, you can have an observation volume in each pixel along a line and each pixel within your frame. And the idea behind this analysis is that if I have a fluorescently tagged protein and it's quite a large complex, like a tetramer, if it diffuses through my observation volume, then it'll give rise to quite a different fluorescence fluctuation to, say, four monomers diffusing through this observation volume. So here's a schematic of a fluctuation that might result from a big, bright tetramer diffusing through my observation volume versus four dim monomers diffusing through the same observation volume. The variance is quite different for the bright uh, tetrameric complex. And the average of this fluorescence fluctuation might be the same, but you can see that there is a very big difference in the variance of this fluorescence fluctuation. So if we compare the first moment, which is the mean, with the second moment, which is the variance, we can understand what the brightness of our molecule is in each observation volume within a raster scanned image. So here I'll show an example where we have a HeLa cell expressing EGFP. We take a region of interest and we scan it rapidly as a function of time. And then in each pixel, we have a fluorescence fluctuation that we can analyze by this moment analysis so we can figure out what is the oligomeric state of our protein. In this case, it's just monomeric GFP, so it shouldn't be too interesting. Every pixel has the same brightness, and we pseudo-color it according to whatever color cursor we highlight this brightness distribution with. But we do just GFP because, importantly, this tells us what brightness we'd expect if we had a dimer, trimer, or tetramer present in our cell. So if I now transfect the cell with monomers, dimers, and pentamers of GFP, I see that I get three brightness distributions despite everything being green, and I can locate where my tetramers, dimers, and monomers are within the image. So the red pixels are the pentamers, the brightest species, the light green pixels are the dimers, and the dark green pixels are the monomers. And so I can go in and spatially map where my protein is oligomerizing. So this is good because in the context of a transcription factor, I can now spatially map where, for example, STAT3 is oligomeric. So if I apply this idea to STAT3 before and at different time points after I've stimulated with oncostatin M, you see that you have nuclear accumulation and then at some point this puncture formation. And essentially, it goes from a homogeneous distribution to nuclear accumulation and then further nuclear accumulation. And if I do the brightness analysis, I can see that STAT3 is dimeric in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. After 30 minutes, it starts to form tetramers in the nucleus. And then after 60 minutes, you have more tetramers and then these puncta forming. 
So this is good, but it doesn't really tell me about how the oligomers came to this spatial distribution. Like, so I don't know when the dimers were recruited in. Did they first bind DNA and then form tetramers? Or did they assemble into tetramers and then go and bind DNA? And I also don't know about the mobility of these different species. And I also don't know about the heterogeneity within each pixel. Because importantly in this method, you have the average brightness in each pixel. So if there's maybe one tetramer amongst a sea of monomers, I will not see that in this analysis. Another method we have access to, which I've already told you about, is this pair correlation analysis. And it's good at tracking the mobility of proteins between two locations. So again, going back to stat three, if I scan a line from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, and I cross-correlate a fluctuation in the cytoplasm with a fluctuation in the nucleus, then I can get what, how long does it take stat three as a population to diffuse into the nucleus. If I do this, all I'm doing is getting the arrival time of this entire heterogeneous population. I don't know if the dimers or the tetramers took longer or even if they're present. I could do a cross-correlation experiment and add a second color in and remove the monomers, but I still don't know whether or not the dimers and tetramers are present for this characteristic time to cross the nuclear envelope, and I don't know um, if it changes where they end up uh, binding DNA. So essentially, we have a method to spatially map the average brightness of our transcription factor. We have a method to track its mobility between two locations, but neither of these methods can actually quantify transcription factor mobility as a function of oligomeric state. So we thought maybe we should just do the pair correlation analysis directly on molecular brightness fluctuations. So what would this mean? If I have a compartment, the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and it's uh, the red dashed line is uh, the nuclear envelope. Then if I have an intensity fluctuation in my cytoplasm and an intensity fluctuation in the nucleus due to all these monomers just diffusing around, and I transform this into a brightness fluctuation using the moment analysis I've already described, then it doesn't look very interesting. It just becomes flatter, actually, because everything is monomeric. But it does become interesting if I have a few oligomeric species present. So for example, in this schematic, I have a couple of dimers present in the monomers, and you start to see a fluctuation in the, the brightness fluctuation. But most interesting for tetramers, you'll see something quite significant. So, and this is because if I have dimers present in a sea of monomers, or tetramers present in a sea of monomers, and I start to get a brightness fluctuation and cross-correlate it with another brightness fluctuation, the dimers become four times more significant in this fluctuation because I've amplified them. And in this case, the tetramers become 16 times more significant in my correlation function because they're four times brighter than the monomers. They're multiplied by something that is also four times as bright. And so something becomes 16 times more significant in my cor correlation function, even though it might be quite a rare species within this heterogeneous population. So the, the take home message from this part is that if you spatially cross correlate brightness fluctuations, you amplify the signal from the brighter species present. So why is this good? Because tetramers tend to be slower than monomers, particularly if they have a DNA binding capacity. So you start to filter out the different species present between the two locations. So not only do I amplify my brighter species present, because the brighter species is bigger, its arrival time is later. And so I can start to see the different species loot out based on their arrival time at this second location. So unlike the brightness analysis where I had the average brightness, I can start to look at heterogeneous populations within a given pixel. And the amplitude reports how bright that species is and therefore what is its oligomeric state. So it's more obvious if I look at a cell or a real experiment that's been transfected with GFP, dimers, and pentamers of GFP. If I take a region of interest and just perform the uh, generic brightness analysis, you can see that the oligomers are in the cytoplasm and there's dimers and monomers in the nucleus. If I now scan a line across the cytoplasm to the nucleus and derive a brightness carpet that contains these brightness fluctuations, I can cross-correlate the brightness fluctuations in the cytoplasm with the brightness fluctuations in the nucleus, and I get this two-peaked curve. So why is this useful? Because uh, now I'm starting to separate out the different species I have present in my image. So if I do the calibration with GFP, again, everything's monomeric, and I get one peak that I know is the monomer crossing the nuclear envelope, 
I know from the amplitude that this should be four times as bright for a dimer or 16 times as bright for a ligama. And so I can start to now figure out the arrival time of my different species between two locations, and I can start to resolve the heterogeneous population within every pixel of my brightness map. So the two main points to make are that with this analysis, the amplitude is proportional to the weighted square of the brightness, so the oligomeric state. And the peak tells you about the time of arrival of the different species. So the, the pentamers are slower than the dimers in this instance. So we use this to investigate STAT3 oligomerization and how it modulates transport into the nucleus and then its DNA binding dynamics. So here we have the two scenarios that we propose could happen. The dimers might be recruited into the nucleus, assemble into tetramers, and then the STAT3 tetramers bind a specific DNA sequence. Or potentially the tetramer formation is dependent on DNA binding, and STAT3 dimers are recruited in. Upon interaction with the DNA M plate, they then further dimerize to form these STAT3 tetramers. So to investigate this, we co-transfected cells with STAT3 tagged to M cherry and a DNA binding mutant of STAT3 tagged to GFP. And we first did a brightness map, and you can see that STAT3 is dimeric in the nucleus, and there are points where it's tetrameric. And then in the case of the DNA binding mutant, there's significantly less dimer and tetramer throughout the nucleus. So we scan a line from the cytoplasm to the nucleus rapidly as a function of time in the two different channels and derive our brightness carpets, which contain the brightness fluctuations in each pixel. We then do the pair correlation between the two points for every pair of columns along our line scan so that we can track the different oligomeric species as a function of space and time. If we do this and we calibrate with respect to free M cherry and GFP, what are the oligomeric states we have? we can read off three important things. So if we look at a column that looks at how does wild type STAT3 enter the nucleus, we find that STAT3 is existing as a dimer at this location and it arrives in the nucleus after three to 500 milliseconds. If we look at the same column where we have the DNA binding mutant, we see that this translocation time is largely unaffected. So DNA binding is important for nuclear import. If you look at another column where we have Dime is present in the nucleus. We see that there's two types of mobility present. There's an immobilized dimer population and a more mobile dimer population on a shorter time scale. And if you look at the DNA binding mutant at this same location, you see that this immobilized dimer population has been inhibited and we only have the mobile dimers. So DNA binding is important for immobilizing that dimer uh, population. Finally, if we look at a column where we know we have tetramers of STAT3 present and they're only um, detected on a more or less immobilized time scale, we find that in the case of the DNA binding mutant, you never achieve a brightness that would correspond to a tetramer and in fact the dimer population that you detect is still diffusing on this fast time scale. So essentially we find from doing this analysis that scenario two applies, STAT3 dimers must first interact with the DNA template and then they can form uh, tetramers upon binding uh, DNA. And we find that this is associated with transcriptional activation because with increasing time after Oncostat and M, we see more tetramer formation. And if we inhibit transcription with the treatment of actomycin D, we see this is reversed. So, the line scan is good, but it's not really appropriate for looking at something as complex as chromatin organization. So what about potentially making this 2D peak home, which is difficult for many reasons. We didn't do a line scan because we wanted to. It's because it's fast that we can scan the molecules at a rate that's faster than what they're moving. And it's also easier computationally. But 2D would be better, particularly when you've got structures like this forming. A line scan's good for nuclear to cytoplasmic transport, but not for investigating how molecules navigate the chromatin network. So we have our line scan, and it has a one millisecond sampling frequency, which is great for diffusion. And in the case of a confocal frame scan taken with, say, 256 pixels, you're really looking at one second. So we need to increase our frame scan rate for 2D peak home to be possible. We have different options. There's the fast airy scanner now, there's a light sheet, or there's like a cheating way of doing a small ROI with a low pixel frame size. And because we don't really have access to either of these, we went with this option. So we also need another thing. We need a new algorithm because doing pair correlation between two points is okay, but doing pair correlation between all the points in every pixel becomes actually very difficult, not just from a 
computational aspect, but for visualization. So luckily, um, Enrico Graton, uh, he, he published a solution for doing pair correlation in two dimensions. And Ashley, as an honor student in the group, uh, she adapted this algorithm so that we could do this in the context of looking at protein oligomers. So what do we do? We take our fast frame acquisition, and then we transform them into brightness frames, and we split our movie into oligomer, dimer, and monomer dynamics. Then in each pixel, we radially pair correlate each pixel with all the surrounding pixels, and we get the average arrival time of our monomer, dimer, and oligomer with respect to some distance in each pixel. And so when we do this, we found that in the case of STAT3, upon stimulation with something like Oncostatin M, if we take our frame scan at the cytoplasm to nuclear envelope and rapidly scan this as a function of time, and we do the 2D peak comb on this region of interest, we're able to map the connectivity of this barrier with respect to tetramers, dimers, and monomers, and see where they're located as where well they're allowed to undergo um, movement. And we can also quantify the average delay time for the monomers, dimers, and tetramers to arrive between this set distance. So this is something we're working on now, so we'll be able to look at protein oligomer mobility in the context of transcription in 2D. So the last project I wanted to talk about, it's not really related to correlation, it's a different approach where rather than looking at chromatid organization from the point of view of the molecules exploring this environment, we use uh, a method to look directly at chromatin architecture based on FLIMFRET. So this project's in the context of the DNA damage response and also for DNA repair factors like transcription factors, diffusion is their main mode of transport when scanning for lesions. And if DNA damage is detected, the DDR will signal this lesion's presence and then recruit the DNA repair machinery. But given chromatin organization and the complexity, a consensus has arrived that nuclear architecture in some way facilitates repair factor recruitment to a detected lesion. But there's um, some controversy over why there is detection of opening events at the, at the double strand break. This makes sense because it would facilitate repair factor accumulation at this location. But more recently, it's been found that there's also compacting factors recruited and there's compacting events at double strand breaks. So an outstanding question is how do chromatin opening and compacting events coincide at a double strand break during DNA repair? So to directly probe nuclear-wide rearrangement in chromatin structure at the level of nucleosome packaging, we employed this flimfred assay um, applied to fluorescent proteins uh, tagged to histones. So Lairs et al. proposed that if you have a nucleus expressing HDB histone tagged to GFP and HDB tagged to M cherry, then in every pixel, if there's some fret, this will report the level of chromatin compaction. So if the nucleosomes are quite far apart, there should be minimal fret. And if the nucleosomes are really compacted, there should be high fret. And it's done in such a way that the tags are at a distance that even within a given uh, nucleosome, although there's two HDBs, uh, intramolecular fret within a nucleosome is minimized. So we used this idea but adapted it with fluorescence lifetime detection and something called the phaser approach to fluorescence lifetime analysis. So here we have our human cell expressing HTB GFP and HTBM cherry so that in every pixel we have the propensity for FRET to occur and report how much chromic compaction there is. So there might be no fret, low fret, or high fret, depending on how close the nucleosomes are to each other. And with our method of detection, we use the fluorescence lifetime. So the fluorescence lifetime of HDB GFP, which is our donor molecule, it actually reports um, how much fret is occurring in that pixel. And using a phaser transformation, we can uh, report the fluorescence lifetime in a more graphical manner. And essentially, in this representation, in this two-dimensional plot, we get these coordinates that tell us about the fret efficiency. So if there's no fret, I have the donor lifetime unquenched. If there's some fret, the donor lifetime is right-shifted. And if there's heaps of fret, then it's right-shifted more. So here I have healer cells, and they're untreated. This cell has been treated with TSA to open up the chromatin network. And this has been treated with actomycin D to compact the chromatin network. And this is the fluorescent signal in the HTB GFP channel, but M cherry is present. So I have my phaser approach to figure out how much fret is in each pixel of these images. And using this analysis, I can figure out that in this image, there's this fraction of fret occurring. In this image, where I've opened up the chromatin, we really reduce the fret. 
And in this case, we really increase the threat. And I, the biggest advantage of this phaser approach is I can spatially map these threat efficiencies. So in the untreated cell, you see the nuclear envelope is more threat, and it looks homogenous compared to the intensity because this method is independent of intensity. But most importantly, when we open the chromatin, you see we lose all our threat, and when we compact the chromatin, we completely compact all of the chromatin network and see high threat. So even though the fluorescence intensity looks rather similar in these images, although this does look more compact, you can see when you look at the nucleosome level proximity that these three nuclei have very different chromatin network organizations. So how is local chromatin compaction modulated during the DNA damage response? So we use our assay where we know this is our phaser location for open chromatin, this is our phaser location for packed chromatin. And I use this palette from here on in to to mark open to compact chromatin. So here's the cell we've selected, and we follow this cell after microirradiation with a two photon laser at a power predetermined to recruit 53 BP1 over six hours. So this is HeLa before, and then at hourly intervals through the six hour recovery. If we look at the FRED efficiency in this chromatin network, we see where the pixels are compact, so red. And then we follow the damage site as a function of time. You see there's an initial compacting event, and then this compaction propagates outward from the region of interest that we've induced a double-strand break within. So if we zoom in, you can see initially there's some compact pixels induced. And then as the hours proceed, you see there's some compaction at the perimeter of the damage site that move around and form somewhat of a, like a foci type structure. But essentially, if we quantify this over multiple cells, what we find is that after induction of DNA damage in this region of interest, we see a sharp increase in the number of pixels that undergo compaction that is resolved by about three hours into the DNA damage response. And if we look at the chromatin compaction outside of this damage site, we see that it statistically doesn't really change throughout the uh, DNA damage response. So there's no real global rearrangement in chromatin organization. So why would the cell uh, have a local border of compact chromatin generated at the damage site, and uh, what is the function? So we saw in a previous study that actually GFP diffusion is allowed in the damage site but restricted to adjacent undamaged chromatin regions. So we thought maybe the function of this border is to modulate DNA repair factor, mobility and accumulation at the damage site. So to investigate this, next uh, we inhibited different enzymes in the double strand break pathway. So first we have a a case where we have not inhibited anything and we get chromatin compaction at the double site and then propagation of this structure outward. If we inhibit ATM, which is one of the first um, enzymes in the double strand break pathway, you can see we've inhibited uh, formation of this compact chromatin border at the double strand break site. If we inhibit RNF8, we find that actually we don't even get a border forming at all. So essentially we find from a statistical analysis of 10 to 12 cells in each of these scenarios, that ATM uh, changes the kinetics of border formation. In, in short, it doesn't really propagate outward and it's slower. And in the case of RNF8, we actually inhibit its formation in the first place. So why, why have a chromatin border? It seems to be biologically relevant because it is um, uh, regulated by these different enzymes. So if we again look at a wild type case, we have HeLa expressing just the histones and we induce damage and we get this chromatin compaction at the damage site that seems to propagate out and surround the damage site uh, by about 60 minutes. If we correlate this with another experiment, we have HeLa cells expressing 53 BP1, a DNA repair factor tagged to GFP. You see that at zero minutes, you get accumulation in the damage site, and this is sustained up until 60 minutes. And actually, it's maximal around 30 minutes in um, terms of multiple cells. So if we correlate 53 BP1 accumulation within this opened region of chromatin, we find that actually when you have chromatin compaction and then it propagates out to the perimeter of the double strand break site, this is actually correlated quite nicely with when you get maximal 53 BP1 recruitment. So as the chromatin compacts and moves to the edge, that's when you see 53 BP1 recruitment in green accumulating in the center of the micro radiation site. Also, we find that if you look at 53 BP1 mobility via the pair correlation assay, that the mobility of this protein is also modulated spatially and temporally with the chromatin border propagating out towards the edge of the double strand break site. Uh, accordingly, we find if you compare this with the scenario where we inhibit ATM or RNF8, that in the case of ATM, 
you have compaction occurring, but it's not really at the border. It's globally throughout the double-strand break site. And in the case of RNF8, you never see chromatin compaction at the double-strand break site. If you look at 53 BP1 intensity, um, we find in keeping with this rearrangements and chromatin organization, that in the case of ATM, you never see 53 BP1 recruitment until around 60 minutes. So you see some, but it's delayed. But in the case of RNF8, if we knock out this, you never get 53 BP1 recruitment. So you don't get 53 BP1 recruitment, and you also don't get this chromatin rearrangement. And this is also true for the 53 BP1 mobility. It's unaffected in the case you don't have this chromatin border being formed. So we think there's a link between chromatin organization and efficient recruitment of repair factors like 53 BP1 to a double strand break site. So what are, what are we planning to do next? Well, we know that chromatin compaction modulates DNA repair activity, but next we would like to know, does it depend on the location of the double strand break site? And do all double strand break uh, foci form and resolve with the same kinetics? So now, um, well, partially because we don't have access to a two-photon laser anymore, we have changed the way we're doing this, and we've got a DIVA cell line which genetically induces double-strand breaks. And the advantage of this is that we have this cell line where we add a drug and essentially we induce about 100 double-strand breaks throughout different locations in the genome, and it occurs over a four-hour period. And so we found that from, co um, tr from transfecting 53BP1 and co-localizing it with the H2AX, that these foci are really um, uh, predicting where we're cutting the genome with this uh, genetic system. So now what we want to do is look at these double-strand break foci and see if the chromatin environment is different as a function of localization within the nucleus, and if it really changes the kinetics of 53BP1 recruitment to these different locations. And so to do this, we will be using the, the FRED assay that we've um, just developed. But also, we've got a new way to analyze it where we can go in and look at the individual chromatin foci that are compact and assess how stable they are using this analysis. So essentially, by taking a time series of these chromatin compaction maps and overlaying them and then applying a moving average analysis, we can figure out which chromatin foci are more stable or more transient within the population that we detect and then correlate this with the timing of 53 BP1 recruitment. And so our plan is to now try and look at the kinetics of repair factor as a function of um, double-strand break nuclear location using this uh, DIVA cell system. So overall, to conclude, uh, the first part of my talk, I talked about the pair correlation analysis, and this is a really great assay when used in conjunction with something like EGFP to indirectly probe chromatin structure with millisecond resolution. And we find that heterochromatin versus euchromatin, they impart different DNA-dependent density flows, and that this is important in the context of the DNA damage response, as well as in terms of transcription factors that are navigating chromatin organization. And importantly, the results we've got with GFP looking at chromatin rearrangements during the DNA damage response recapitulate what we've seen more recently with the FLIM-FRED assay. The, the PICO method that I measured is very good for tracking the diffusive route of protein oligomers in general, but it's um, particularly good for transcription factors because it, it specifically amplifies a very low population of, of tetramers, for example, and this is often the case for transcription factors. And we found from using this methodology uh, and applying it to STAT3 that you have dimers upon phosphorylation being recruited to the nucleus and then forming tetramers on the DNA template in a DNA-dependent manner. And then lastly, this uh, uh, phaser histone flimfred assay with developed, um, it's useful for looking at chromatin dynamics directly and measuring nucleosome proximity in live cells. And we have other ways to um, quantify the rearrangements that we observe, like the average size and spacing of these foci that we detect. But it's particularly powerful when combined uh, with looking at the diffusion of a protein and how that regulates accumulation and mobility of a repair factor like 53BP1. And so you can correlate it directly with the chromatin rearrangements that are occurring at that location. And so this assay is good for uh, quantifying nuclear-wide chromatin compaction. It's amenable to image correlation analysis, so I didn't have time, but you can also quantify the size and spacing of all the foci that you detect. And in the context of the DNA damage response, it's great for looking at lo local versus global chromatin rearrangements. So the pair correlation is great for teasing apart a very specific local rearrangement, but this really gives you a spatial map and image of how chromatin is rearranging. And so in conclusion, I'd like to thank the people who have been involved in this, in particular, 
Ashley Solano, who um, is involved in the PECOM project and looking at all the oligomer mobility, um, and Jay Chong Lu, who's really done heaps uh, on the Flimfred assay and many of the projects in the lab, and everybody else in my lab, uh, my former boss Enrico and his postdoc Lorenzo Tony, who generated a number of the cell lines, and my former boss Kat Gauss and my funding. And uh, thank you for your attention.